Hi, I'm Dan, and if you're new to homebrewing, so am I. Welcome to my adventures in homebrewing. Hey everybody, it's Dan, and it's that time once more to go around the world one more time and have a beer or two along the way. Thanks a lot for coming out and joining me this week. Uh, greatly appreciate it. Uh, let's say a big thanks to the guys at the Community Brew, Brew Shop for being on the show. Greatly appreciate it. Christian and Derek are fantastic guys from down home. Check them out. Uh, more than willing to support these boys, and also they're more than willing to support you in whatever you do. So uh, a couple of things. Uh, I'll be entering uh, the Bulls All Natural. And they're one of the biggest uh, independent brewers in Canada. Uh, kind of like Iron Brewer, kind of like Iron Chef, but Iron Brewer competition. So I'm just waiting to get my box and see what comes. Uh, it's pretty much just a kind of like what Iron Chef is. You don't know what you're going to get. And then you got to figure it out from there. So last year I entered it. Everything I got, you could make a um, an old beer with it um i thought it was pretty good but i guess others didn't like it so oh well so be it um so uh this week we're going to be talking about uh, things that i learned uh while making a very large beer so i was making my baltic porter and yeah i ran into a few problems so there was a few things i learned along the way i'm going to throw in maybe a little bit uh, a video from the actual brew date into this so uh, if you're just listening to this on uh, on the podcast, go over and check it out on the actual uh, YouTube site. Uh, you can find that probably also over on my Facebook page or on the actual website and uh, go from there. So uh, right now, let's get a couple of a uh, couple quick words from the sponsor. Hey, it's Dan here one more time, and I'm happy to say that we are now, or should I say my podcast, is now sponsored by Escarpment Laboratories, yeast production for the fermentation of the exceptional craft beer. Whether your kit is on the stovetop or in a commercial brew house, wholesale yeast and quality control for the profitable bro pro brewer, community engagement and education for the discerning home brewery. If you are a craft brewer and you love using quality yeast, and you really do need to check out Escarbon Laboratories. Dan here one more time to say thank you to the great people over at Brewer's Friend for the fantastic offer they have just given us. For all the new users of Brewer's Friend for their first year, you're going to receive 15% off. That's 50% savings on this great piece of software. And what is Brewer's Friend? Well, Brewer's Friend is a complete recipe designer, brew day planner, and journal. The details make the difference between an average batch of homebrew and a truly ex excellent brew that is repeatable. Brewer's Friend automates the details, guides you through the brewing process, and saves all the data. And how do you get all this fun stuff? Well, once you go in and you sign in and you go to sign up for Brewer's Friend and to get that 15% savings, you need to use the promo code PODCAST. That's all you got to do when you sign up. Type in podcast for the promo code and you will get 15% off. Again, thank you to the great people at Brewer's Friend for this, and I'll see you on the other side. All right, guys, we're back. So, yeah, so this week I made a Baltic Porter. So we're looking at roughly about uh, 20, close to 20 pounds worth of grain going into the Brewzilla. Um, one thing we did do this week was that uh, we actually used the uh, the Scarment Laboratories Isker um, Lager yeast because believe it or not, a Baltic Porter is a lager. I never knew that. I never thought to actually uh, look into it and see if it's actually a lager or an ale. You would think a porter uh, would be an ale, but it's not. Oh well. Um, so. What's gonna what's what happened was is that uh, was a was a bit of a late start. Uh, we got going, uh, got everything milled out, uh, and uh, I was a, a little confuddled. Uh, I was using the new Brewers Friend app, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, but there's a little bit of playing with it I need to do because I'm having a hard time figuring out how much strike water I needed, and also uh, how much sparge water was needed uh were, were my grain levels right so a little a little bit up and down there but overall that app was fantastic 
really really cool please go check it out you probably saw in the uh in the little bit of advertising there that you can get 15 percent off uh new users for your first year of brewer's friends so check it out use the promo code uh, podcast and it'll go a long way so once I got everything milled out, uh, it was fantastic, uh, come out really, really well. Uh, basically a five gallon bucket was pretty much filled with all the grain that I was going to use. And I had to get this into the malt pipe. So I put it in about four, four and a half gallons worth of water into the actual Brazil to get it up to about 170 degrees. Then there was different levels that I needed to get it to. So when we started doing it, the first level had to be around 152, whatever else. Oh, excuse me. I'll put up the recipe down the side here. So you'll be able to see it. Whoop, wrong finger. <laughs> you'll be able to see it here uh, and uh, you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, I'll make sure that I put in how much the amounts and everything else. Uh, so we had mirror solder actually, so I'm not wrong. Hang on. So things were, were going actually pretty cool, but, um, yeah, for some reason I kind of screwed things up some way, somehow. Uh, and I think the main way I screwed up was that, uh, not using uh, enough rice holes. So rice holes are like everyone's friends. Bolted porter. There we go. So in the bolted porter, we had uh, eight pounds of mirror solder, three pounds of Munich light, uh, three pounds of dark Munich, uh, one and a half pounds of wheat malt, um, 78 ounces. Or see, here's the thing it goes 0.78 of a pound of crystal 60. So I'm assuming that's probably 78 grams 70 ounces correct me if i'm wrong um then you have the same amount of dark crystal then uh same amount of rye malt uh, then you have a bunch of uh, then you have uh, 0.42 of a pound of dehust carafa 2 0.42 of a pound of chocolate wheat and then also uh 0.78 of a pound of uh, brown sugar so yeah so we've got all that doing its thing uh, in there. So you, all in all, we were looking at uh, close to like 20 pounds worth of grain. So that was pretty crazy. Um, I put in what I had for rice hulls. I thought I was going to have enough. I had a good, a good amount in there. Uh, put everything in, start mixing away. And then as I was mixing, I was just like, this is not all going to fit. It fit. Don't me wrong. But... I couldn't use the overflow pipe or the actual um, overflow valve for when I do Vorloff and sparging. So things got a little hairy. So once I did that and I thought I, everything was going right, because the water, like anything for Vorloff was going in and coming down, no problem. I was waiting, doing my thing, whatever else. But when it came time to sparge, I was getting good color on, on the wart, but once it came down to sparge, everything got stalled. And I was like, this isn't normal. It normally just, it, it rips through, uh, coming through uh, the actual, the actual malt, the rinse, whatever else. And I was just like, I was almost through all the sparge water I had. And I was like, why isn't it inside the kettle? So I had to get in there with the good old, um, mash paddle and go digging go figure so i have a desk that i use in my garage and i have my robo brew set on top and or my brazilian not robo brew brazilla and the malt pipes up so i was hoping this thing would be sparging by now I was, and i was wondering why it was so heavy i mean yeah i know wet grain is heavy but it's a little more heavy than normal so put it there i'm not hearing it drain as well I'm, I'm like, oh, maybe it's just because there's a lot of grain. So I start pouring, pouring, pouring. And I'm like, this is getting kind of crazy because now it's going over through the actual eyelets for the actual handle that you use to lift the pipe out. And I'm like, oh, this is not good. I'm seeing grain going down into the pump, or not the pump, but down into the kettle and then avoiding the bag I use to help catch all the crap. Um, getting in there with the actual mash paddle. And as soon as I get to the bottom, 
I do one quick pull and I'm like, oh, I got to put my knee against the actual thing to keep it in place. Give it a small pull off to the side. And all of a sudden I hear all the water comes running out. And that's, it, it was like, oh Lord. So I had to go digging for almost a good 20 to 30 minutes to get all the water or all the liquid I put in out of the grain. Then I had to finish up with the was and I, which I got me up to about seven gallons. So which that, that part worked well. So note to self, invest in rice hulls, invest in a lot of rice hulls. If you're doing a big beer like this, I, I'm assuming maybe now right now, the more rice hulls, the better. <laughs> so we'll, we'll see. Um, now things have progressed enough that uh, we're getting into the boil. So what, one thing I've learned now is, is that as I'm doing my sparge is to get, so it doesn't take so long, is to start heating up to a boil. Get everything there. Boil is going fine. Everything is going great. And I'm like, oh, okay. So no harm, no foul. Everything is moving. Everything's trucking along. And then when I go to use the whirlpool arm to help with the cooling down, all that stuff that came over the side and, and avoided the actual pipe or that the bag I used for the pipe got stuck inside the pump. I'm like, oh, so the wart chilling process took longer than normal. I was able to get it down to about 68 degrees. I needed to get it down more. I needed to get, get it down to about 54 degrees. So once I got it down far enough that I wasn't going to hurt the actual fermenter, I transferred everything in, made sure everything was sanitized, turned on the glycol chiller, let it get cold, and I chilled it that way. And I got it down to 55 degrees, put my yeast in. And now the thing that I'm noticing is, is that um, I think my yeast may have been expired just because it took me a while to get to this one. So I may have to go and uh, do a repitch, which not a bad thing, but it's something I, I would prefer not to do because then they're going to let oxygen in, possibly oxidize the beer and go from there. But I am not going to waste all that, <laughs> all this wort. I'm not. So I'm probably going to go over to the whole brew store later today, get a package of other lager, another package of lager, or maybe even a package of ale yeast. We'll see. And, uh, pitch it and see what happens um yeah things have been kind of crazy this week when it comes to making beer um so i made a cherry lambic a little while ago with a buddy of mine and it fantastic 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 it went so smooth um what i'm noticing now is is that it is bubbling up through, through the airlock so uh so I guess it's not just lessons learned from doing the Baltic Porter, but also lessons learned uh, from doing this Cherry Lampic for the first time. So uh, the Cherry Lampic went really, really well as well. My buddy Brian came over um, and he wanted to learn to make beer and we were planning on doing this beer because it's a beer that another one of us uh, has actually made. So we figured this was what better way to learn how to do something than to actually go and do it. So I got everything out went and did it we got everything all got everything done and then when it came time to transfer it into the fermenter so we used a 35 liter demijohn so just goes to show how big this beer is is mainly because i had to put nine and a half pounds worth of pureed cherry into this so all the cherry is in the beer's on top. It's all fermenting. It's been fermenting like a demon for the last few days. I went down uh, yesterday in the afternoon because I saw it in the morning. It looked fine. Yesterday afternoon, went downstairs and it oozed up through the top like a brick. And now you're probably thinking, well, that's not good. I'm like, well, what else are you going to do, right? It's not, a, not the end of the world. I have lots of airlocks, cleaned it out, sanitized it, put sanitizer in it, took the old one in put the new one in and went and cleaned the old one. So it's not the end of the world. But uh, I guess um, some of the major things, I guess, for lessons learned um, 
overall for all the beers one uh make sure that your recipe actually meets the size of the system that you're using um the other one uh would be uh make sure that if your yeast may be expired, I'm not saying the stuff I got was, it may be. It could also be that it's just so big, I need more yeast. Um, uh, if your yeast is close to being expired or is expired, use a starter. So that's something I got to learn to do. Uh, make sure you have all your hops ready. Make sure that uh, if you're going to be doing something this big, it might be best to do it in batches or you have safeties in place to make sure that things like a pump, whatever, don't get clogged. So uh, I, I've learned that lesson. The other part is, um, I guess, yeah, patience is, is the big thing. I mean, don't be scared to ask for help. Don't be scared to reach out to people if you know you've screwed the pooch somehow and you're looking for help to make sure everything gets done. Um, yeah, it, it, it was really weird because I've been brewing back into brewing now for almost three years and I've only had a problem like this two times where uh, I've clogged the pump or I've had so much grain that I couldn't see down inside of the, I couldn't see the overflow valve or even the overflow pipe. I couldn't use the top screen. So it's, it's only been like two or three times that this has actually happened. And it's only been the beers that have been big beers, like anything that's up close to like a nine or 10% beer. These are the only ones that I've had issues with. Um, so maybe I need to do it in smaller batches. I don't know. Let me know what you think. Is it better to do um, a, something like a Baltic Porter or an Imperial Stout in batches? So in two brew days, but in smaller amounts, make sure you get the right amount and just put it in and that way you don't have to worry about it. Or is it better to do it uh, all one shot and just roll the dice and see what happens. So I'm usually the guy that's just roll the, roll the dice and go for it. But uh, after this week, I think maybe going in smaller batches, I would like to get a bigger brewing system so I can avoid all this crap. But that is a different, pro that is something else in the making right now. So we'll see. Um, we're eventually going to get there eventually i will have a bigger system but the, but the downside to getting a bigger system is is that i need to have 220 or 240 volt in the house that means i would need to have that installed down to the breaker i have the i have the i have the space in my breaker panel but it's the idea of having to get an electrician to run it down to the panel through uh, our ceiling in the basement and things like that it's a little little hairy not necessarily something i really want to do but we'll see. Um, yeah, I'd be really curious to know what some of you guys have uh, experienced doing uh, these big beers. If you run into problems and things like that, uh, it, it's it's not necessarily something that um, that happens a lot. Um, and it, it, it got me concerned. It didn't frustrate me. It didn't deter me from doing what I was doing. I found a way to get it done. Uh, and I got it done. Um, am I happy with the way things went? No, uh, there's a lot of things that I can do to improve. Like I can have my setup done better. I can have things in a better spaces. I could, there's a lot of things we can change. It's like, but they're all little things. Uh, big things though, is just, just making sure you, everything you have to make your life easy on, on brew day uh accessible is is a big thing and and um, and i've learned that a lot and i'm still still learning that like like i said rice hulls all your stuff accessible uh sanitary equipment make sure that you have things to help you out get things unplugged so tools if you need them uh make sure that you uh, have uh all the water whatever else that it is you need on hand uh, I mean, I'm fortunate I have a tap in my garage so I can have access to water. And I am also fortunate in the sense that I'm able to keep all my stuff outside and set up all the time. Once it gets colder, everything's going to come in. So we'll see what happens. Um, yeah, it's, it's it was just a weird, weird, weird uh, brew day. Um, and it's been a weird week for the Cherry Lambic as well. 
just seeing it ooze up through the top there and where I thought a 35 liter demijohn would have lots of room <laughs> in it to prevent anything from coming up through the top. So yeah. Um, so this is probably going to be a really short one this week, guys. It's only going to be about 20 minutes. Lessons learned. Thanks for tuning in. <laughs> I'm working on uh, getting some uh, interesting guests in this week uh, or next week. I've actually reached out a, to a beer historian. I didn't know these guys existed, a beer historian. So I reached out, out to a beer historian uh, to see if he would be willing to come on the show. So I'm just waiting back to hear from him. I'm waiting to hear back from him, I should say. And uh, we'll see what happens. So yeah, I'm more curious to know what you guys have learned from lessons learned and all, all, on your brew days and things like that uh, because that helps me out and hopefully what I've done helps you out. So thanks for coming along for the ride, guys. Uh, it's Dan and I'll see you on the other side.